I'm Paul Levinson, and welcome to Light On, Light Through, episode 94, The Sopranos Revisited. Well, you might ask, why am I revisiting The Sopranos? Actually, it's always a good idea to visit The Sopranos. It's one of the all-time greatest shows ever on television. And in fact, as I've been saying for years, I think it stacks up with Shakespeare and all the great works throughout the ages in any medium. But today is November 1st, 2014, and I thought it would be an especially good idea to revisit The Sopranos today, because in just a few days, on November 4th, 2014, HBO is issuing a complete set of all 86 of The Sopranos episodes on Blu-ray and on digital HD and all of those good things. And in addition to that, included in this set will be a special 45-minute documentary called Redefining a Television Landmark, for which I was interviewed. Uh, That was almost a year ago, last spring, and who remembers what I said? I'm sure a few interesting things at least. But I thought as a way of commemorating this release, I would bring back into play a series of reviews of The Sopranos. In fact, reviews of the very last nine episodes of The Sopranos, along with three additional podcast recordings of my thoughts and analyses after that fabulous and controversial Sopranos finale. And these were done a few days after that finale. Now, originally, I did those reviews as part of a podcast, Levinson News Clips, and they were posted literally, in some cases, four or five minutes, in other cases, maybe 25, 30 minutes, after the episode had concluded on HBO. But sad to say, Levinson News Clips is no longer in existence, mainly because the company that was hosting that podcast decided they only wanted to have podcasts that were video podcasts, which are great. But Levinson News Clips was an audio podcast. However, I, of course, kept copies of all of those podcast reviews, and I put them together this afternoon for this new episode of Light On, Light Through. And so you can sit back and listen to my reviews of the nine episodes, along with three additional podcast comments by me. The whole shebang is about maybe 45 minutes or so. The podcasts are pretty short. You'll hear me say before each of the podcast Levinson News Clips, But again, this is actually light on, light through. I also had blog posts to go along with those podcasts. They've been online all these years since June 2007. You can find links to them on the lightonlightthrough.com podcast page. So that's L-I-G-H-T-O-N-L-I-G-H-T. T-H-R-O-U-G-H dot com. So rather than talking about these reviews, let me now turn the podcast over to my earlier self. And you're going to hear first the review of the first of the nine final episodes of The Sopranos, followed by my reviews of the other episodes. Enjoy. The Light on Light Through podcast I'm Paul Levinson, and this is Levinson News Clips, and I'm beginning tonight my reviews of the first of the nine concluding episodes of The Sopranos on HBO. And as I watch the opening credits of The Sopranos roll by tonight, I was reminded about how much we owe to this show. Before The Sopranos, there was no Deadwood, The Wire, 
No Rome on HBO. No Dexter or Brotherhood or the Tudors on Showtime either. For that matter, there was nothing like 24 or Lost at its best on the networks either. The Sopranos changed all of that. It made television grow up. With The Sopranos, television entered a new golden age. The Sopranos did that by doing just about everything different from what had been done before. Not just the obvious language, but the pacing, the characterization, the locales. Always surprising us with a twist from the mob stories and suburban lives we'd come to know. And The Sopranos did that again tonight. It was an amazingly slow-motion story, an oil painting come to life. It felt like at least 20 minutes of the show were on Tony and Carmela, Bobby and Janice playing Monopoly at Janice and Bobby's summer home up near Canada. Bobby doesn't like the soprano change of rules in Monopoly. I'm with Bobby, by the way. Everyone got drunk. Bobby punches Tony. They fight. And before the show is over, Bobby has killed someone for the first time in his life. No, not Tony. But some guy Tony has ordered Bobby to kill to facilitate a deal Bobby has helped set up with some drug-dealing Canadians. Now, in regular television, all of that would have taken place in about five minutes or less. So why was it so much longer tonight on The Sopranos? It's because we only have nine, now eight, hours to go with this story, and we need to enjoy, savor every minute of it. So the tableau is set. Is Tony really a new man after his close encounter with death last season? Maybe not. He's still ready to kill on behalf of good business, and he hasn't lost a beat in his genius, that unique genius that Tony Soprano has, of killing two birds with one stone. So he does the Canadians a favor, and he sticks it to Bobby at the same time. But Tony stuck with a nickel and diming gun charge from something that fell in the snow three years ago. And everything's seethingly unsettled with everyone else, just as it was last year. I'm Paul Levinson. Enjoy. The Light on Light Through Podcast. I'm Paul Levinson, and this is Levinson News Clips. And I'm continuing tonight with my reviews of the last nine episodes of The Sopranos. Tonight, episode two of The Last Nine. Well, it was a superb media-on-media story tonight. Daniel Baldwin, great on Homicide Life on the Street and a notable hack actor of late, put in a fine performance on The Sopranos tonight playing Tony in Christopher's movie. And Geraldo Rivera, fresh from his heated exchange in real life with Bill O'Reilly, appeared on The Tonight Sopranos as a talk show host interviewing guests about who will be the next mob leader. Now, actually, this was likely taped for The Sopranos before Geraldo and O'Reilly went at it, which was probably somewhat staged, too. But it's fun to think that what we were watching on The Sopranos tonight was really happening as we were watching it in real time. And the director, Sidney Pollack, was a pleasure to watch tonight also, not as himself, but as a doctor who murdered his wife, serving time in Johnny Sachs' cancer ward in prison. This had little to do with the central story, but it had some of the best scenes in this magnificent episode anyway. The media-on-media story that did animate the action tonight, and indeed spilled over into Soprano lives, as all good media-on-media stories do, was the realization of Christopher's Cleaver movie. Godfather meets Saw, as Christopher put the story of the movie, is just what it sounds like. 
Baldwin plays a slightly hefty mob boss who gets his just dessert from an axe-wielding monster. Now, Tony might have enjoyed this homage to himself, and in fact did, at a screening attended by the whole Soprano extended family. I could easily relate to this. Not that anyone has made a movie about me, but I've attended at least two similar screenings for movies produced by my wife's cousin. But at the Soprano screening, Carmela, no dope, notices that the Tony character, played by Baldwin, is having an affair with a sexy young thing. And as Carmela, of course, explains a little later to Tony, the axing of Tony Baldwin at the end of the movie is nothing other than Christopher acting out his true feelings about Tony in the making of this film. Christopher wants Tony dead. And as we see clearly in a great psych scene with Tony and Melfi, the media on media story has come full cycle. Christopher made this movie, and now in real life, it's starting to eat at Tony, kindling misgivings he already had, maybe even leading him to believe that Christopher Moltisanti is a threat to him. The final hug at the christening of Christopher's baby carries the delicious, unsettling ambiguity of some of the great pivotal hugs we've seen in gangster movies at christenings and weddings and funerals over the years. I'm Paul Levinson. Enjoy. The Light on Light Through podcast. I'm Paul Levinson, and this is Levinson News Clips. And I'm continuing tonight with my reviews of the final nine episodes of The Sopranos. Tonight, episode three, in which the sauce was slowly simmering. Tony's tomatoes are coming in, and he wants to be around to pick and enjoy them, like any other suburban man. But the feds are digging up a body that he and Paulie dispatched years ago. So the two have to get out of town for a while to Florida. Tony has always had a conflicted relationship with Paulie. He loves him as he would an older brother. But Paulie and his mouth and his thinking represent everything that Tony would love to leave behind in his life. If only he could do that and devote himself to his tomatoes. Paulie is a threat to Tony on some level. Both men understand this. But I can't believe Tony would even for a minute seriously consider killing Paulie just as a way of keeping him quiet. Tony has never killed anyone in such a proactive way, and it certainly didn't make sense that he would embark on such a course tonight, at the very time when he's thinking more and more of what life would be like without the business. Killing Paulie just to keep him quiet on general principle would be about the worst piece of business Tony ever did. Still, the day on the boat in Florida tonight was very suspenseful. Meanwhile, Uncle Junior, who did put a boat into Tony, is doing the best he can in his institution, which isn't very good. Junior tries to get a card game going to bring back some of that old zing, but of course, that doesn't last. He has a choice of being drugged and docile on the one hand, or cheating on the drugs on the other, which makes him incontinent. Not a very good place to be. And as tonight's episode ends, we're still in a status quo, but one which is slowly simmering to a boil. Phil's back in power, and Tony will be his competition, which Tony will face with his imperfect, fraying relationships with all of his top guys, Paulie, Christopher, Bobby with the exception of Silvio, who in fact may pose the greatest threat of all to Tony, since Silvio was the one who killed Aid. 
I'm Paul Levinson. Enjoy. The Light on Light Through Podcast. I'm Paul Levinson, and this is Levinson News Clips. And I'm continuing tonight with my reviews of the final nine episodes of The Sopranos. And tonight we look at the fourth hour, which just finished airing a few minutes ago on HBO. Well, it's become clear to me that these last nine episodes of The Sopranos are not really a mini-season, but a series of postscripts, carefully and satisfyingly rendered. Rather than seeing a new story, we've seen a sequence of older stories wrapped up, existing characters clarified, and in some cases brought to fruition. In the previous three episodes... Bobby has asserted himself with Tony, Christopher made his movie, and Junior tried in vain to free himself from the psychological shackles of his institution. Tonight, the focus was on Tony's lawyer Hesh, played by Jerry Adler, and A.J.'s relationship with Blanca. Tony owes Hesh $200,000. Now, usually this would be no problem for Tony to repay, but Tony is afflicted with a gambling problem. I don't recall this from any previous year, so the series loses points for bringing in a major new problem that we didn't know about before just to support the action tonight. Other than that, though, we get some fine exposition of the relationship of Hesh and Tony, especially Hesh's fear that Tony might kill him rather than repay the money he owes him. Hesh probably speaks for every other major man in Tony's organization, with the possible exception of Silvio. They all must think somewhere deep down that Tony might kill them given the right-wrong circumstances. This certainly went through Paulie's mind last week. But Tony has changed and may be unlikely to kill any of them, if in fact he ever would have been. Certainly Tony would never have killed anyone close to him over money. Tony's money problems tonight also brought him into conflict with Carmella. But their big conflict, what happened to Aid, has yet to come. And poor AJ. Unsurprisingly, Blanca leaves him in the end. Life is tough, for every son of a mobster in The Sopranos, including Vito's son, whose story also wrapped up tonight. Hesh and Blanca likely put in their final significant appearances. Nancy Sinatra, by the way, put in a fine cameo, crooning to Phil Leotardo, These boots are made for walking. No, that's not what she sang to Phil. She sang something much nicer. And this continued the great cameo tradition of Geraldo Rivera in the final nine hours of The Sopranos. We've yet to see all that much of Silvio, and Christopher and Carmela still have major unfinished business with Tony, and only five hours left to conduct it. I'm Paul Levinson. Enjoy. The Light on Light Through Podcast. I'm Paul Levinson, and this is Levinson News Clips. And I'm continuing tonight with my reviews of the final episodes of The Sopranos. Tonight, Episode 5. Tony and Christopher never got over their killing of Adriana. How could they? They both loved her in their own ways. And although her cooperation with the feds was as bad as Big Pussy's, she was different from him, different from any of the other members of the family who might have deserved to die. Christopher's made a good show of getting over her. He's happily married, he's a father, he made his movie. But a part of him can't stand the sight of Tony, however much he might mostly deny it. Christopher says that Tony enables his drinking, which Chris is trying to stop. But the deeper truth is, every time Christopher sees Tony, he sees Adriana. And he hates himself, as well as Tony, for killing her. And 
he's finally beginning to let a little of that out tonight, telling those who might listen that Tony doesn't show him sufficient gratitude for the sacrifice that Christopher made. And of course, Tony doesn't. And not just because no gratitude could ever expiate the guilt that Christopher feels, but also because Tony, for his part, very much wants to forget this. It's the worst part of a life that Tony is already more eager than ever to leave. And so tonight we see the first unraveling, the beginning of the Sopranos coming to terms with the killing of Adriana. And it's just the beginning. Played against the backdrop of AJ's problems, which are eminently normal, getting over a broken heart because you were jilted, that's normal in comparison to the broken heart of Christopher, which will never heal. But AJ's personal problems somehow spill into being Tony Soprano's son, as they always do. And AJ is walking down a bad path, too, in this night of nephews and sons on The Sopranos. I'm Paul Levinson. Enjoy. The Light on Light Through podcast. I'm Paul Levinson, and this is Levinson News Clips. And I'm continuing tonight with my reviews of the final nine episodes of The Sopranos. Tonight, episode six. And what a kick in the stomach that episode was. Well, after five relatively quiet episodes, The Sopranos finally got down to really serious finale business tonight. It was thoroughly expected... It was certainly warranted, but whew, it was a kick right in the stomach or the solar plexus, as I was just saying. Tony had problems with Christopher from day one, but the killing of Adriana put their relationship in a new, far more drastic and merciless light. Christopher felt he made the ultimate sacrifice for Tony, giving up to murder the woman he loved. And Tony knew that Christopher held something over him, the murder of Adriana that no one other than Silvio Dante knew about. But since Silvio not only knew about it, but it pulled the trigger, there was no way he could ever talk about it. Not so Christopher. But Christopher never really did talk about it, except in very oblique references to Tony. We heard Christopher talking to Tony about that last week. And that's what made tonight so difficult. Difficult for Tony Soprano. Difficult for us, the viewers. Now, Christopher did do plenty wrong. Just last week, he blew away the scriptwriter of his movie... Leave it to the writers of The Sopranos to have the writer killed. Their commentary, no doubt, on the way writers are treated in show business. It made Tony uncomfortable, understandably, to see any part of his story on the screen. And tonight, Christopher was driving, drugged, and the car carrying him and Tony went off the road. I don't think Tony could ever have brought himself to gun down Christopher or order one of his guys to do it. But tonight, Tony took advantage of the situation, spurred by the realization that Christopher's drugs could have led not only to Tony's death in the car, but the death of Christopher's baby, whose car seat was impaled by a branch, spurred Tony to take fate in his hands, and suffocate Christopher, who was hurt so badly he might have died anyway. But Tony knows full well that Christopher might not have died either. The rest of the show was a haze for Tony and, I bet, most viewers. The death of Paulie's ma did provide some comic relief. Sorry for the disrespect, Paulie as almost no one except Tony and Carm show up at her funeral. 
Daniel Baldwin's appearance at Christopher's funeral reminds us of the importance of that movie to Tony. After the funerals, Tony takes a trip and has some good sex and trips out with one of Christopher's women. A.J. continues his sorry, petty criminal ways, and tensions rise between Tony and Phil. But for now, R.I.P. Christopher Moltisante, your actor, Michael Imperioli, put in an unforgettable performance of a lifetime. I'm Paul Levinson. The Light on Light Through podcast. I'm Paul Levinson, and this is Levinson News Clips. And I'm continuing tonight with my reviews of the final episodes of the final season of HBO's The Sopranos. Well, A.J. reads from W.B. Yeats's The Second Coming tonight. The poem reads in part, Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. And what rough beast, its hour come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. Well, what rough beast indeed. This poem pushes A.J. to almost committing suicide. Tony saves him. The poem, of course, perfectly captures just what is happening to Tony and his family and business as we reach the end of their story in this series. But the thread of tonight's episode that struck me as an even clearer picture of Tony's situation concerned Meadow. With tensions dangerously rising between Tony and Phil, one of Phil's guys comes over to Meadow's table at a restaurant in Little Italy in New York City. He makes sexually harassing remarks to Meadow, and Meadow tells Tony, Tony comes close to killing the guy. He later admits that he lost it over his daughter, but managed to exercise some restraint by not killing this guy. But this means little to Phil, who ups the insults, another big ante. But what else could Tony have done? He would have been within his rights entirely as a father to put Phil's goon completely out of his misery. Tony did show remarkable control, but he's paying the price for it anyway. He did the right thing, the best he could have done under the circumstances, and he's still being drawn ever more deeply into a pit with no escape. And this has been Tony's story all along, hasn't it? and the story of the Sopranos. On the one hand, an upper-middle-class family, even rich, suburban parents who love their children and want what's best for them. On the other hand, in a business which, however hard Tony and others may try, inevitably bleeds into their personal lives, as Tony Apley puts it in his conversation tonight with Phil. There's no getting beyond or away from or out of this. The only question now is whether Tony and his family will survive. I'm Paul Levinson. Enjoy. The Light on Light Through podcast. I'm Paul Levinson, and this is Levinson News Clips. And I'm continuing tonight with my reviews of the final episodes of The Sopranos. Tonight, episode eight. Well, Tony lost Melfi, Bobby, and likely Silvio in this next to last episode. He took these losses, that is, Bobby and Silvio, because Phil was able to strike first, despite the heads up Tony got from his FBI informant, an interesting reversal of roles the FBI guy informing Tony. Mistaken identity plagues law enforcement all the time. Wrong people arrested, wrong people convicted. And tonight it took its toll on Tony's crew. They killed some white-haired guy who looked like Phil, but wasn't Phil. 
Now, Melfi's leaving Tony was no great loss for Tony. It was never clear to me what good she did him anyway. Will Silvio pull through? Paulie tells Tony that the docs say Silvio likely won't recover consciousness, but the docs have been wrong before, especially on television. And good for Patsy for at least firing back at Phil's gunman. That no doubt stopped them from killing Sil outright. And Tony? Well, I'm going to make my prediction now, and I'm going to say he is going to survive next week. Why? Other than that's what I want? Well, I think Phil's lost the element of surprise now. Tony is ready for him. And barring some treachery from Paulie or one of the other guys close to Tony, Tony's not likely to be caught off guard again. There's an old saying I saw once somewhere, if you can survive a hit, you are stronger for it than if you hadn't been hit at all. Now, I've seen no spoilers. I could be wrong, but I think we'll see Tony standing at the end of next week's finale. The finale of finales. I'm not as confident, though, about Tony's family because I don't have much faith in Phil's adhering to the tradition of not taking out family members. I'm Paul Levinson, looking forward to the next and last final episode of The Sopranos. Enjoy. The Light on Light Through podcast. I'm Paul Levinson. This is Levinson News Clips, and I'm reviewing the very last episode of The Sopranos, the ninth of the final nine episodes. And I'm still trying to come to terms with this ending of The Sopranos, in which, on the one hand, nothing happened, life goes on, but on the other hand, maybe that's the most powerful ending of all that we could have had to this remarkable story. Tonight, all predictions of deaths, except Phil's, which was the easiest to predict, were defied. Tony and his family and all of his guys live on. Even Sill, who though still in a coma, did not die yet either. Tony will likely go to trial. That's not good news, but as his lawyer, Neil, says, hey, trials are made to win. Junior is definitely senile. Meadow's going to become a lawyer, and A.J. may get his club in the end after all. So nothing much has changed. Is this David Chase's way of pulling out the one kind of ending that was not predictable, that life just goes on? Perhaps. But there's also this. After last week, after Bobby's death, after Sill shooting, after Tony is so close to the edge, we, the audience, can never again relax. Even with Phil dead, we have to wonder, how can Tony just sit there in that ice cream parlor diner with Carmela and AJ? Will Meadows coming in late have some sort of meaning? Will she just miss the murder of her father, maybe her whole family, that will take place just a few seconds after the final scene cut to black? Who, after all, was that guy who went into the bathroom? Was he carrying a gun? The point may be that Chase has finally succeeded in getting us, the audience, to fully identify with Tony and his world a world in which nothing can ever be totally safe. So what happens after that cut to black? May be that everyone gets killed, or just Tony gets killed, or who knows, maybe just Meadow, or maybe life just goes on and on. Anyone want to make any predictions? I'm Paul Levinson. Enjoy. And here are some important program notes. This ending was so extraordinary that I will be doing a few additional podcasts in the next few days in which I further discuss the ending. So stay tuned for those. Also, we will be doing a conference at Fordham University in the spring of 2008 about The Sopranos next year.
You'll be able to find details about that on InfiniteRegress.tv. That's Infinite Regress, R-E-G-R-E-S-S dot TV. And Infinite Regress is one word. So look there for our announcement about the 2008 conference about The Sopranos. The Light on Light Through Podcast. I'm Paul Levinson. This is Levinson News Clips, and I'm back with some more thoughts about the remarkable ending to The Sopranos. I've seen a lot of responses to the ambiguous ending, ranging from disappointment and outrage to satisfaction and joy. This is much like the response to Frank R. Stockton's the Lady or the Tiger, when it was first published in 1882. The story went on to become an all-time classic. A suitor for the princess of a kingdom is put on trial by the king. He's put into an arena and asked to pick one of two doors. Behind one is a lady, behind the other a tiger. If he picks the door with the lady, he'll be set free and would live but he'd be obliged to marry the lady. If he goes for the door with the tiger, he'll be ripped to shreds. Of course, he doesn't know which is behind which of the doors. He loves the princess, so choosing the door with the lady may leave him heartbroken, but at least still alive. Now, the princess knows what is behind each door. She loves the suitor. She gives him a signal, indicating which door the suitor should choose. If he chooses the lady, the princess will have to see the man she loves spend his life with another woman. If he chooses the tiger, the princess will see him die. The suitor opens the door, and the story ends right there. Much like the Sopranos cut to black. Let's assume for the moment, let's assume that the blackness plus the conversation with Bobby on the lake about what happens when you get whacked, remember he said you never see it coming. Let's assume that all of that means that Tony is shot in the head by the guy who walked into the bathroom. But did he just kill Tony? Or Tony and Carmella, Tony and AJ, Tony and Meadow, everyone at the table. And if we allow the possibility that maybe the darkness isn't Tony's, but someone else is at the table, or maybe everyone else other than Tony, well, then maybe everybody else at the table is killed and Tony survives. And then, of course, if we allow the possibility that no one was killed, In that case, then the guy just went to the bathroom, not to take care of business, but to do his own business. So, David Chase has given us a Sopranos or the Tiger ending. He's the princess. He knows what's behind the door of darkness. And where are all the suitors in the arena? But unlike the princess... Chase is not clearly pointing to any door, and unlike the suitor, we have many more choices than just two doors. But like the suitor, our choice of door depends upon what we think Chase wants us to see beyond it. And even more importantly, what we in our hearts most want to see. One other thing. Frank R. Stockton published a sequel to The Lady or the Tiger, The Discourager of Hesitancy, a continuation of The Lady or the Tiger, three years after he published the original story. I'm Paul Levinson. Enjoy. And a program note, continue to listen to these podcasts because I will have several other analyses of The Sopranos ending in the days ahead. 
And also, again, check out our conference that we'll be doing in the spring of 2008 at Fordham University in New York City about The Sopranos. You can find details about that conference at infiniteregress.tv. That's infiniteregress, R-E-G-R-E-S-S, dot TV. Infinite Regress is one word. The Light on Light Through podcast. I'm Paul Levinson, and this is Levinson News Clips, and I'm continuing with my discussions of the meaning and reception and implications of what I'm coming to believe is one of the best endings in the history of television, motion pictures, maybe all creative arts of humanity. Now, the debate is raging. There was a great piece in the New York Times last week quoting David Chase from an interview that Chase gave Alan Siepenwall in the Newark Star-Ledger. And after reading that piece and thinking about what David Chase said, which was, well, everything is all there for you if you want to see it, I think I'm beginning to see what the main issue is that everyone is really talking or arguing about regarding the ending of The Sopranos. On the one side, we have the closure junkies. This is a group that at one time or another includes everyone, all of us, me too. Real life often does not have definitive endings, so we crave them in our recreations, our recreations, our fiction. We may desperately prefer a happy ending, a sad ending, a villain to get his just dessert, a broken heart to find true love. But what all of us want even more than that is some kind of ending that we can hang our hat on, wrap our minds around. That's what fiction is supposed to be about. Maybe. But if it is, who says that's the way it has to be? Maybe fiction can sometimes satisfy, satisfy even more deeply by not resolving much of anything. There are precedents for this. In Frank Stockton's The Lady or the Tiger, as I mentioned in my last podcast, Stockton's ending, of course, was not just more of the same Life Goes On, which some have been saying is the ending of The Sopranos. Stockton's ending to The Lady or the Tiger was a little different than that, but it provided no closure. It's an excellent example of a truly and deeply ambiguous ending. There have been precedents for this on television, too. One of my all-time favorite series was the radically unfinished Coronet Blue in the 1960s. Frank Converse plays a guy who washes up on a New York City shore with amnesia. He can't remember a thing, and he mumbles the phrase, Coronet Blue. The series was a fragment. It was an unfinished summer replacement. And we never did find out the meaning of that phrase. Now, a biography written by the producer was published a few years ago, if you really want to know what Coronet Blue means. But I'm not going to provide a link to it here because I think the series worked better unfinished. I can still hear that Lenny Welsh theme song, Coronet Blue. Anyhow, David Chase, of course, could have done whatever he wanted with The Sopranos, and that's just what he did. He chose to put in a deliberately, radically unfinished ending. And in so doing, I think he's in effect issued a challenge to all of us, all of us closure junkies. Are we ready to kick the habit and at least consider going to the other side? an overlapping group of who knows how many who may love closure in most of their fiction, or at least in some of their fiction, but also can enjoy an extraordinarily open ending. Now, I'm not saying that making this challenge was Chase's specific intention. I never presume to talk about creators' intentions. What I am saying, though, is that this is the net result of the Sopranos ending. 
As I've already mentioned in several of my podcasts here and there and in blog posts, I readily admit to being an anti-closure sympathizer. Indeed, at least two of my novels, The Silk Code and The Plot to Save Socrates, have been criticized by the occasional critic, benighted, of course, in my view, for not providing enough closure, for leaving things at the end too close to the way they were at the beginning. In science fiction and mystery, I do admit to always enjoying a story which lets us in on all sorts of crazy goings-on and then leaves us with a view that, for most of the rest of the world, life is just going on as usual. There's a great mise-en-scene sequence in Alfred Hitchcock's Frenzy, his 1971 movie. A strangler kills a woman with his tie in her London flat. And the camera pulls back out, out the door, down the stairs, out the front door, and across the street, and just stops there. And we see cars and people and life going on as usual on this London street in the afternoon, knowing all the time that a vicious murder just took place upstairs in the flat across the street. That is, the people walking in the street don't know it, but we, the viewers, do. So, having loved that sort of ending, I guess I was already there for Chase's ending, even though I certainly didn't expect it. Though, you may remember, I did consistently predict that Tony would live. And I expect that there are many more out there who are kicking the closure habit and getting to love the Sopranos ending the more that they think about it. I'm Paul Levinson. Enjoy. And a program note, keep listening to these episodes of Levinson News Clips for further thought and speculation on the meaning and impact of the Sopranos finale. And again, if you have a chance, go over to infiniteregress.tv That's infinite regress, R-E-G-R-E-S-S dot TV. Infinite regress is one word where you'll find our announcement about the conference we're having at Fordham University in the spring of 2008 about The Sopranos. The Light on Light Through podcast. I'm Paul Levinson. This is Levinson News Clips, and I'm continuing with my analyses and discussion of the finale of The Sopranos. And I think of this discussion as The Sopranos and Hamlet. And the rest is silence. Well, I didn't say that in a British accent, but some of you may recognize that as the famous, many-sided, ambiguous last line of Shakespeare's Hamlet. It's ambiguous because the rest could mean respite, could mean sleep or remainder, and silence could mean quiet or death. So is the remainder what comes after the story of Hamlet? Just a time out or a death of everything we have seen. When Horatio says this about the bodies he finds strewn on the floor, which we presumably know are dead, what is he telling us about what happens after that? I was reading Dick Cavett's excellent piece written before the Sopranos finale a few days ago, and I realized that in addition to the Lady or the Tiger Echoes, The Sopranos also partakes of Hamlet. I'm sure I'm not the first person to make this connection, just as I'm sure I wasn't the only person to call forth the lady or the tiger, but I thought it useful to record it here. And the rest is silence, has been praised by I.A. Richards and many other literary critics as the ideal ambiguous ending. And like the lady and the tiger, And the rest is silence is a triumph of written language. In the case of the Sopranos, the rest, of course, was not just silent, but sudden black. And it was shocking in a way that the last words of Hamlet were not. 
because the soprano spoke in image rather than words, and it defied our expectations utterly of how a television show, let alone an entire highly successful series, should end. And you know what? It made me more sure, less ambiguous than ever, that the Sopranos as a whole, and its ending in particular, will surely take its place next to Shakespeare. I'm Paul Levinson. Enjoy. And now a program note, as I've been mentioning, I will be continuing these assessments of The Sopranos. You might also enjoy some of the things I have to say about Lost and about the ending of Lost and about 24. I'll also soon be reviewing a few episodes of Meadowlands. And in the fall, I'll be reviewing Dexter and Heroes. So if you enjoy these podcasts, uh, you hopefully will have a lot to listen to in the months ahead. I also want to remind you that we're doing a conference on The Sopranos at Fordham University in May 2008, and you can find information about that on my blog, infiniteregress.tv. Regress is R-E-G-R-E-S-S dot TV. Infinite Regress is one word. And by the way, you'll also find reviews there of Big Love, Meadowlands, The Tudors, Rome, Dexter. You'll find more shows reviewed there than I have time to do on this podcast. So come on over if you have a chance, and uh, I look forward to having you as a reader. The Light on Light Through Podcast. Athens, 2042 AD. She ripped the paper in half, then ripped the halves, then ripped what was left again into bits and pieces of history that could have been. Sierra Waters had read once that, years ago, it was thought that men made love for the thrill, while women made love for the sense of connection it gave them. Curled up with a good book says, Sierra Waters is sexy as hell. You can find out more about The Plot to Save Socrates by Paul Levinson at theplottosavesocrates.com. about an ancient biotech war raging on in secret for centuries.